trailer for Furiosa came out a couple of days ago from when we're recording this. And I didn't know it was due to come out. I, it just dropped kind of unexpectedly. But uh, we knew that the movie was scheduled for 2024. So I guess it was just a matter of time before they started teasing us. Um, but I was very amped going into the trailer, of course, being such a fan of Fury Road and the, and the franchise. Uh-oh, I sense a butt. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to say, there were moments in the trailer that gave me some pause. I, yes. I was uh, looking at kind of the, the VFX shots. There was one where Chris Hemsworth, who seems to be playing like a villain or maybe like a, an ambiguous character who's you know, not sometimes an ally, sometimes an opponent of Furiosa. Um, he's like getting swept off of a, some high place by a bunch of bullets or something. And that shot looked really, the VFX looked unfinished. Like everything was really sharp and really saturated in a way that seemed too real, uh, almost like a video game cutscene. And it reminded me of some of the stuff that I'd seen in like the Hobbit movies um, and not in a good way. So, uh, I was like, huh. And then a few more moments like that were peppered throughout the trailer. And I was thinking, hmm, okay, weird, interesting. Um, I don't know if you saw 3,000 Years of Longing, but uh, it it felt like, you know, that was George Miller's last film. And it reminded me of the VFX shots in that, where you could tell that there was a lower budget and it started to, you know, some of the seams were visible. And I was, I was getting a little concerned. Uh, how did you feel when you saw the trailer? I too thought the color grading was really vivid, so vivid that it didn't feel natural. But I, I do feel like, when's the last time you saw Fury Road? A couple of years ago. Okay, so there's a couple scenes in there for sure. I think there were some color grading in there. Yeah. Um, but I'm with you. Um, it didn't look practical. I don't blame George Miller considering how difficult production was on Fury Road. So I imagine he wanted to avoid the headache. Um, VFX obviously saves a lot of money and time, but I'm with you. It looks a little too artificial in certain points. It looks like a lot of it was green screen. It looks like they plopped Thor into this world and just made him a little more demented. Yes. I, I hate the fact that Chris Hemsworth wearing a red cape in this because it reminds me too much of Thor. <laughs> yeah. I can't unsee Thor. Yeah. And the entire time I'm thinking, why is Thor in this? They clearly gave him like a fake nose. They, they made him look more ugly because I guess they felt like if he just came I in. Is that possible? <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, they, you know, it's it's a really big kind of protuberance and it definitely, <laughs> it, it definitely uh, disrupts the usual Chris Hemsworth look. So I guess they maybe they went with that so that people kind of see him more as a villain. Maybe. I mean, maybe there's a correlation between Oscar attention and big noses like Bradley Cooper's. <laughs> Yeah, like with my show. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I don't know. I really liked uh, the Mad Max character in Fury Road. Yeah. Even though I thought he was very different from Mel Gibson. And so I kind of wish he was in this. I know this is like a spinoff and it focused on Furiosa. And you could argue that Fury Road is about Furiosa. But Anya Taylor-Joy doesn't give me the same sort of intense feeling as Charlize Theron. I mean, I feel like she could she could get there, but I, I, you know, the movie, I'm going to have to see the movie essentially to, to really decide on that. Yeah. And to your point, I think in that universe, there's no real hero or villain. Everyone's kind of like an anti-hero, except maybe Immortan Joe. Yeah, he's a straight up villain. Who's yeah. clearly, yeah, who's clearly evil. Um, but I do think there's going to be some switching sides, switching allegiances, a love triangle. Maybe, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, with like Immortan Joe and... Thor vying for Furiosa's attention somehow. Possibly, some way. yeah. Yeah. And uh I'm cautiously optimistic. Yeah, I mean, uh George Miller is is to be trusted as uh, you know, the he is he he prevailed through all of Fury Road. And like if you read like like you were saying, if you read about the behind the scenes uh experiences uh on that movie, like yeah, he had the movie in his head constantly, and it might have caused tension with the actors like uh, Tom Hardy and Charlie Theron were often at their wits end trying to understand what he was doing. But eventually he delivered on it. You know, he he defied all expectations and multiple attempts to shut down the movie because, you know, he he, uh, he knew what he was making. But I don't know what to make a. George Miller, because he does Fury Road and Happy Feet. And I can't think of two more opposite movies. And I don't know what his 
niche. I don't know what his trademark is. <laughs> He's almost like a director for hire where you hire him to do anything that you would possibly want. And he'll probably do a, do a good job of it. But he doesn't have a trademark like a Spielberg or Ridley Scott or someone of that ilk or even a Chris Nolan where it's very their style and plot and characters are very specific to that char- director. Yeah. I mean, I think if you had to pick a trademark for him, it would be the Mad Max franchise because that was the first thing he ever directed and the thing that he's consistently worked on through his whole career. And that, but you're right, you know, some of those other divergent things like Happy Feet or uh, uh, the Babe movie um, are, are kind of weird. Uh, <laughs> I forgot he did Babe. <laughs> yeah. Um, they are they're very tonally different and uh, so like maybe maybe he is more of a director for hire on those things than he is in Mad Max and like everything he does that's not Mad Max is just him trying to um, finance more Mad Max no that's fair that's fair we shall see this could further Anya Taylor-Joy's career which has which had been really hot or it could just maybe stop dead in its tracks Uh, but should we get started with the rest of the episode sure Welcome to the Extra Buttery Podcast. It's a show about movies, TV, anything with a story and actors on a screen, really. Join Jason Chan and Robert Snow's free-flowing conversation with deep dives into characters and plot with the occasional salty opinion. So get your popcorn. I got mine right here. Let's start the show! Welcome back to the Extra Buttery Podcast, episode 121. My name is Robert Snow in Toronto, and I'm joined by Jason Chen in Vancouver. Hello, hello. <laughs> I was waiting for you to say something. A little delayed. Yeah. I mean, sorry, not on my A-game right now, but <laughs> it'll get better, I trust it's me. It's Sunday morning right now in, uh, in Vancouver, so Jason's still waking up. Um, I, d- I did have a late night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, this time on the episode, we're going to be talking about Killers of the Flower Moon, the latest from Martin Scorsese, as well as Ridley Scott's Napoleon, Alexander Payne's The Holdovers, The Marvels, and The Killer. A lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. Five movies. We're doing, as usual, we're doing some catch up over the past couple of months worth of movie watching, but uh, stick with us. You know, there's there's a lot to get through. <laughs> um, please listen to our show, please. So Killers of the Flower Moon is first up. And this is a movie that uh, I mean, it's funny to compare this actually to Napoleon because uh, uh, you know, Ridley Scott, when he's doing press for his movies, he loves to shit talk people. And <laughs> whether it's like historians who are calling him out for the accuracy of his movies or uh, people who... who um, you know, doubt him at his advanced age as a director. Yeah. He's He's got sharp words for everybody. And he even had some sharp words for Martin Scorsese because, uh, you know, they're both of similar ages, but he was essentially dunking on, on Scorsese by saying like, look, Scorsese took uh, the better part of uh, six or seven years to get Killers of the Flower Moon made and released. And in that space of time, I've made three or four movies. Um <laughs> But they're obviously very different directors and like the different styles of working. Um, Scorsese is famous for, you know, uh, attention to detail. And he may not do as many takes as someone like a David Fincher, who we'll talk about later. But, um, you know, when he does make a movie there, you can tell that there's a lot of care that goes into it. Um, And Killers of the Flower Moon is no exception. Well, we mix these families together and that estate money flows the right direction. It'll come to us. Shomikasi. That's how you are. I don't know what you said, but it must have been Indian for handsome devil. <laughs> <laughs> it's a movie that uh, we've been waiting for for a number of years, delayed a little bit by COVID, but now it reaches us the story of a sequence of deaths and murders happening on uh, within the Osage Nation in Oklahoma in uh, the period after the First World War. 
all tied it to the oil wealth that uh, the indigenous people, the Osage uh, people uh, had come into as a result of oil being discovered on their land in Oklahoma. And all of the white people who came to this part of the, of the United States and were sort of greedily eyeing all of the wealth that these people were accumulating and trying to use various skullduggery to uh, get access to the title on these oil wells, marrying into indigenous families, trying to basically getting control of family money by marrying into these families and then seeing to it that anyone else who might inherit that money gets killed off. So very, very spooky stuff that obviously has had ripple effects in the United States for generations afterwards. But what did you think of this? This is a lot of, a lot of talk in this one, about this one with regard to its length, um, but the performances being really strong. Did you pick up on any of that? The length was okay. Um, I was very cautious because this was like three hours and 26 minutes, I believe. And you factor in commercials and all that. It's a four hour block of your day just gone yeah something like that and i was very cognizant of that and it it took me a while to find the actual time (laughs) of the day to actually go see this movie but i am glad i saw it um the acting was good i don't think this is dicaprio's best work but i do think he has made a habit of playing really broken white men (laughs) i actually thought it was really interesting it wasn't a straightforward biographical movie like i thought it would be Mm. Yeah. There's some title cards in there. There's some like sequences in there that are very much more about emotion rather yeah. than the story or the dialogue. Uh, the production value is incredible. I loved it. Yes. There are certain parts that I had to catch on. I, and I do think if you go in with a better knowledge of the history of the events and like the area, I think you probably catch on a little faster. Mm-hmm. Like for the first half hour or so, I had to... Well, it didn't hit me until a little later that uh, when these First Nations, when the Osage applied to get money from the government for the oil, they had to go through a white person to do that. Yes. Yeah. They were like some of them were uh, declared incompetent by uh, by the uh, the government. And so they had to basically go into an office and say, I am an incompetent but I need money for this, that, and the other thing. And then it would be up to this white guy to determine whether their claim was uh, legit. Um, I don't think that was the case for everybody, but it was the case for um, the one of the main women um, played by... Um, Lily Gladstone? Lily Gladstone, yeah. Who is, she is the, she's the... She's the main character. The main character of the film uh, who ends up married to Leonardo DiCaprio's character. Yeah, and I think... The one thing I really appreciate in this film is that there's no, like, sniveling villain. Mm. Yeah. You could have easily had those because some of the characters are actually caricatures. Yeah. Um, some of the hitmen they hire and some of the hicks that they deal with and some of the people who, like, mastermind this plot to kill all these First Nations families and steal their money and whatnot. It could have easily devolved into that. And at certain points, like, I think it toes that line. Mm-hmm. But for the most part... Every character is fully formed and realized, and I appreciate that. With regard to the length, like, this is a story that spans something like 20, 30 years, at least, um, depending on where you kind of draw the boundaries. And so, you know, you you can make the argument that the movie kind of needs to be long in order to fairly incorporate all of the details and give you a sense of just how widespread this plot by the white people was and how many people died as a result of it um because you have probably the most villainous character in the film uh played by robert de niro this guy uh, king who uh you know he he's unscrupulous no yeah no scruples at all he'll you know he introduces himself he's like hey call me king and uh you know, they, he he sees himself as this benevolent character who uh, claims to like the Osage. But the more time goes by, the more you realize, like, no, he really just sees the Osage as a source of, of money that he can exploit, that he can manipulate um, while putting off the um, the auspices of being a benevolent community leader. Um, so he's very, very crafty. But. And very self-assured, you know, he he doesn't think that the even when the FBI or the the the, the nascent FBI, because this is very, very much at the beginning of the existence of that that agency, um, even when the FBI starts investigating, he doesn't he's not scared at all. He thinks that he can weasel out of it without too much trouble. Um, so 
by the end of it, you are very much rooting to see, see him taken down a peg. Um, and then there's this final scene that uh, lays out what happens to all the characters in the, the decades afterwards. And you're, you th- end up thinking, oh, geez, you know, a few of them got, a, uh, got uh, punished a little bit, but it didn't really uh, stick. So, well, I mean, it's typical history, right? Like people, those in power just get away with it for the most yes. part, right? Yeah. So it's not like there's a, a truly happy ending by any means. I did like that scene, though, the way they ended it. How they basically turned into a radio play. Yeah, I thought yeah. that was very clever. Um, there are a couple movies who did that as well. Do you remember The Warriors? Uh, it's that like cult film about street gangs from like... Oh, I, I never saw that one. Oh, okay. There's a woman who does a radio broadcast and she kind of narrates the film as it goes along. And it really reminded me of that. Maybe it's just the color red. Maybe it's just the, I don't know, the aesthetic. I'm not sure. I was going to say though, for, for a movie that's three and a half hours... You don't really feel it. I've been in movies that felt longer. Yeah, it's kind of flat, but I do feel that you're always invested in it because there's always something interesting going on. It just really takes its time getting there, but you're never bored. Yeah. There's no highs or lows. There's no like big scene, big blow up scene or anything like that. Everything's just a bit of a slow burn. There, There's a bit of a high and a low, but it never gets too high or too low. And uh, But I am glad that when the movie finishes... Um, like, I, it was nice to get up and stretch my legs. Yeah. I mean, it didn't work for everybody because I, I vividly remember coming out of my screening of it and there was somebody who was uh, seated, you know, elsewhere in the theater who was talking to his friends and he was like, God, that was awful. So long. I can't believe it's one of the worst things I've ever seen, he said. Really? That's interesting. I had people clap. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I think it's it's more divisive than uh, than you might expect from a Scorsese film. And um, and I guess for some people, it just boils down to like they if their attention span is too short or if uh, they're not kind of latching on to the um, the drama of this situation, they for them, the the time is just like ticking by really slowly and they just can't wait to be out of there. So, yeah, um, it's not a not a surefire winner for everyone. It reminded me of The Irishman. Very divisive, uh, long runtime. But when I was watching The Irishman, I never got bored. I had to take a break in between. Sure, but yeah. I was never bored. Yeah, and I mean, like Scorsese will uh, has been quizzed about this too, and he he says like, well, you know, people will happily sit down and binge four hours of TV on a Saturday night. So why can't they do this? And that's interesting. He said that because the thing with TV is that every episode has a big climax or cliffhanger. Yes. Yeah. And that's what keeps you going because you want to know what happens next. Yes. With the Osage County, the the Killers of Flower Moon, it's kind of, you already kind of know what's going to happen. You just don't know how it's going to get there. Yeah. And you also just wonder what happens to each of the characters. But as you said, none of them really suffer any real consequences, except for a few people. The humor was a little, it, it was nice to break up the tone a little bit, but it was also a little much sometimes. Yeah. Like I said, sometimes the caricatures become a little too much. Like the the dumb characters become too dumb. Yeah, like you, <laughs> people have made fun of Leo's uh, performance in this uh, to an extent because uh, he feels like he's kind of making this like fish face for a lot of the, the he is, like yeah. he's kind of like his m- mouth is kind of pursed and he's like you know um, he had this he's his brow is always furrowed yeah and he like this look of like non comprehension as uh, the smarter villains kind of use him to get to the money that uh, Lily Gladstone's character has. Um, like I said, not his best work, in my opinion. I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's up there for me. I, I would definitely place it in maybe like top five performances for him. But he's not playing the kind of character who jumps off the screen. He's It's a little bit more of a, you know, you, you compare it to like his role in uh, um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Like that was a very obvious, like lots of really, really big moments in that where they shoot, that stick in your memory. Whereas this, he's kind of got to be, he's got to be the the unsuspecting type, the the kind of guy who can lull Lily Gladstone's character into a uh, false sense of security because he doesn't seem like he's capable of the sort of um, crimes that he ends up perpetrating. I actually thought the best performer was De Niro. Yeah, he's really good. Yeah. A a little return to form. He doesn't have to be mean anymore, but he definitely has a presence because he's playing a, uh, a version of a mob boss, really. Yeah. 
without the kind of trappings of like the Italian mafia. But yeah, like yeah, uh, yeah, no silk suits. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I thought he was really good. Lily Gladstone was good. Um, I might have to watch it again just to see, because I do find her a little too stoic sometimes. And as you said, Leo DiCaprio has that face, and it just. It, it, it kind of rubs me the wrong way after three hours. It's kind of like, is, is it like a twitch or is it a feature or is it like you're trying to overact a little yeah. bit? Yeah. What did you think of when De Niro had to spank DiCaprio? I thought it was hilarious. Yeah. Also a little, that's one scene where I thought lo- was really off because I thought spanking was just a really childish way of punishing someone. And and the implication was that De Niro or King was part of this secret society or higher society that they never really delve into. Yeah. Well, they, they have it staged at like, what is it? Like a Masonic temple or something. Yeah. 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 Um, so I guess they. And, and from what I know, that is true. Like, I believe he was involved with the Freemasons at some point. No. I don't know anything about the rituals that the Masons might have had back in the 1920s or whatever. But so. Well, me neither. But I just thought the association was historically accurate. oh okay yeah but i uh, i mean maybe spanking was done as a as a way of punishing people back then in that group but um uh yeah all i know about it is that apparently the the cinematographer um was surprised with how much gusto de niro put into the spanking so but they yeah, apparently he actually spanked dicaprio yeah but they put pads in, Di, in dicaprio's pants so that he didn't have to really take the full uh, brunt of it i'm um, not sure this is a top five dicaprio performance because i think he was way, way better in Wolf of Wall Street. And I think he was way, way better in Blood Diamond. I see. I don't with Blood Diamond. I and I and I and also I think he was better in that Mary the Rev- movie. Oh, the Revenant. Tom yeah. Hardy. Uh, the Revenant. See, Blood yeah. Diamond. And he's done some stuff earlier in his in his career that's also really quite good. Like when he was a boy, basically. But yeah. But see, for me, Blood Diamond doesn't rank very high because the South African accent gets on my nerves. Really? I've heard, I've read that it's actually very good. Oh, okay. And from, maybe it's just that I just don't see him as being South African. So like I know he's. Oh, really? Like, I thought I can't he's get, pretty convincing. I can't okay. get immersed in it, but whatever. Uh, it's been a long time since I saw that movie, okay. so who knows? A Wolf of Wall Street. That's perfect for him. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's career topping for sure. Um, so, what are we thinking for Oscar chances for this one? Is it uh, because the last. When was it? Screenplay for sure. Screenplay. Um, Lily Costume Gladstone design. for actor. Best actor. I thought she was being entered as supporting. She's supporting? that. Uh, that's kind of... Uh, well, because a... it's political, right? Like, it's easier to, to win. Right. But that's that feels like a snub uh, from the production company, if that's the case. Because she's, like, the main person. Yeah. She was uh, independent. Oh, no. That's not. Uh, best actress. Okay. You might be right. Yeah, I, I, I can see her being Best Actress, for sure. I think that makes a lot of sense. Apparently, she was going to quit acting. Yeah, she was going to like uh, study for some like computer science or some other field, and then she got a call from or an email from Scorsese asking uh, asking her to audition. So DiCaprio for one of the acting categories, and De Niro, De Niro as well. I think they probably enter in separate categories with De Niro getting supporting. Yeah, just to spread it out um costume design production design yeah most likely um screenplay all the major ones for sure i think editing would be an interesting one but editing's tough to t- say sometimes but i do like how it's edited yeah and I, like more than a few critics pointed out that they you know like you were saying they it's a bit different for scorsese with the editing like it is um yeah there's more moments of like subjectivity and spirituality yeah there's a little more brevity there it's it's less um straightforward than some of his previous biographical films Mm -hmm. yeah so it doesn't always move linearly and it does jump around from place to place and time to time but it's easy to catch yeah which is uh you know that when you put it up against something like oppenheimer which was also doing that um you will find your like that that'll be a pretty close race to watch i think because there will be people who really think that oppenheimer mastered that sort of keeping everything straight in the flow of time uh whereas some people will really like uh what uh killers did so i think oppenheimer was the stronger movie Mm, for me yeah i i mean i like the subject matter of oppenheimer 
promote oh, really? on a personal okay. level. So I'm more, I'm more, I'm more drawn to that. Um, but yeah, this is still like, you know, one of the best of the year. No question. Yeah. It's up there. I don't know if it's Scorsese's best work, but it's up there. But I do think I'm the opposite. I thought Killers of the Flower Moon, the subject, subject material was more interesting to me. But I thought Oppenheimer was just better executed and more, um, I was in most, more emotionally invested in it. I thought it was the better dramatic piece. Well, uh, staying on the historical movie side of things, should we hear from you about Napoleon? Move along now. Those in power only see me as a brute, unfit for higher office. But I follow in the footsteps of Alexander the Great and Caesar. Evil minds that plot destruction. If you look down, you'll see a surprise. Once you see it, you will always want it. Sorcerer of death construction. So we know you know how we talked about Killers of Flower Room being three and a half hours and not feeling boring? Yeah. Napoleon feels boring. <laughs> and it's like an hour shorter. I know. And it felt like it was three hours. There were there was a good five or ten minute stretch where i really wandered off and dozed (laughs) (laughs) dozed off and this was a very uneven movie for me oh i I think it does kind of show really scott's age and i do also think that it shows that really scott is focused on other things so if you look at scorsese's movies are like the attention to detail the accuracy it's all it's all very much there and i know really scott was you know, criticized for historical inaccuracy. And I have to defend him here a little bit because I don't think you go to see a a historical movie for accuracy. No, no. Like, go read a textbook, man. Exactly. The movie should not be the basis of your education unless you're critiquing film. Like, there's a scene in the trailer for this that a lot of people were latching onto where Napoleon is shown firing cannons at one of the great pyramids in Egypt. And yeah. and people were like, some historians were like, well, we don't have any proof that he ever did anything like that. All we know is that he conquered Egypt. And like Ridley Scott's uh, point of view is like, well, you don't know that he didn't do that. So I can put it in my movie and, you know, whatever. Just uh, uh, I'll, I'll say right off the bat that I, I don't think I particularly enjoy this movie. It was fine. And this is coming from a big Ridley Scott guy. Oh, yeah. You're well, he's one of your all timers. But yeah, yeah, he's one of my all times. So. You can see the really Scott in it. Like the action scenes are incredible. Mm-hmm. The camera work is really good. The the dramatic stuff is really dramatic. But it comes in spurts. It comes few and far between. It moves very chronologically. But the way he deals with time is a lot less sophisticated than what Scorsese did with Killers of the Flower Moon. And it ends up being being boring. Right. Part of the big appeal of napoleon is that we we know he's insecure we know he's also a tactical genius but we never really understood what drove him and that was the one big thing missing from this film we saw napoleon's greatest hits we saw him do all the battles uh from his first win at the uh garrison to his final one at waterloo to him coming back from exile and then after and onwards and so there's a few major set pieces that are really good but it moves so choppily and it moves so incoherently in the sense that we don't ever understand what drives napoleon what he's thinking at the time i don't think joaquin phoenix really understood either so during production one of the stories was that joaquin phoenix would go to really scott and be like i don't know how to act this i don't know what's going on and really Scott re- rewrite the whole thing or they do the whole thing together. I remember talking about that with you and I was like, wow, that's kind of cool. Like they must have, yeah, they must have really had a, a moment of inspiration or something. And I think Joaquin Phoenix was onto something. You never find out what drives Napoleon. And I think that's what Joaquin Phoenix uh, struggled with is that he didn't know how to portray this character's arc. He doesn't really change. The, his amount, the amount of power he wields changes, but what about his character changes? And that's the same with Vanessa Kirby. I thought she was really overrated in this movie. She didn't have a lot to work with to begin with. But I never understood what the appeal was with Josephine. Uh, there are a couple lines in there that are just so awkward and out of place and funny. You're supposed to 
revere Napoleon, but you almost come away just laughing at him. And apparently Ridley Scott was questioned about that, and he said it's okay to laugh at Napoleon. Like, some of those more comedic moments are intentional. Right, but why is the rest of the film so serious? Mm. I don't understand that. Like, if you look at Gladiator, which I think is, like, peak one of peak Ridley Scott films. Sure, yeah. It is very, very consistent. The character arc is very understandable. Yep. There are funny parts, but it doesn't overtake the film. And it, it, it and it's him joking around with his buddies. There's scenes in here where him and Josephine are talking to each other, having a dialogue. And it's supposed to be a revealing conversation about their personalities and their motivations. Right. And it just, he ends up basically pulling off one-liners and, and without knowing it. And you're laughing at him instead of with him. Right. And, and it just cheapens the whole thing. So... I mean, what, does Joaquin Phoenix do a good job of acting? Yeah, he is. He's a really good actor. Does it really sh- showcase his his range and his acting chops? I don't think so. Mm. Definitely not with Vanessa Kirby. And there's too many characters just kind of like popping in and out. Uh, there's a lot of political stuff going on that he just kind of assumes you understand like he'll just toss you something and then you're supposed to kind of understand it but it doesn't breathe because it covers so much ground and it moves so fast sometimes it's not like kills of flower moon where like you get the time to breathe and understand what is going on yeah but but the action sequences are great the uh, the scene in the trailer where you see where they he shoots cannonballs into the ice that scene is great i mean it, it visually looks stunning that was one thing that I was actually excited to see. So, you know, I'm still going to watch it because I, you know, I, I do love it when he does historical action and, yeah. um, you know, the... It is a lot more gory than I thought. But I mean, I should have expected it. It's really Scott. <laughs> yeah. We saw Dismemberment in Gall- Gladiator. Of course, so. yeah. But he is getting old. I, I do think he's a bit of a scattermind. Do you think it suffered at all from like, you know, like we were talking about in the... Uh, in the beginning, the uh, the way that he is moves so quickly and is working on so many projects concurrently, you know, the, he hasn't he probably has only wrapped shooting one movie when he's already launching into production on another, and uh, you know he he's able to put out sometimes two movies a year at that pace. I, I do think he's more of a big picture guy. He's he he's kind of like this is the theme I want. This is the way I want to shoot it, and we're gonna do it. And he's old school. Right. He's not. Yeah. I, I wouldn't call him an, an auteur, not in the same level mm, as Scorsese. No, no, no. Yeah, that's true. I think Scorsese for him, it really is about the art. I think his deta- attention detail is better. And I also think he showcases that detail a lot better because he allows things to breathe. Really, Scott, the attention detail is is there, but he doesn't let you linger. He doesn't let you stay there for more than a few moments. Yeah. He's almost you, like you said, to your point, it's almost as if he's already looking ahead to the next thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I can imagine him being a guy who's just like one, two, three, four, five. This is the five things we're going to do. One is done. Let's go to two. Two is done. Let's go to three. Yeah. Where Scorsese is like, okay, here's one, two, three, four, five. And you know, we get to three and maybe we'll go back and change one depending on how three goes. Maybe we'll skip four and go to five. We'll different lengths. We'll see it. We'll play it by year. Yeah. But I don't think that's how really Scott works. Um, I do encourage you to see it. I think it's, Overrated. I think it'll get nominated for certain awards like production and sure. Joaquin Phoenix for me for actor. And we'll see how Vanessa Kirby does, but I don't expect it to win anything. Yeah, it'll be in the conversation, but not uh, not really winning any trophies. Um, that's all right, though. Uh, well, uh, also in like kind of historical, not that far in the past, but zooming forward to the 1970s, we have The Holdovers mm. from Alexander Payne. <laughs> Every year at Barton Academy, students, faculty, and staff depart the campus for a two-week winter break. But there are always an unfortunate few who have nowhere to go for the holidays. They're known as the Holdovers. So this was something that I was excited to see because uh, they'd been placing the trailer in front of a lot of stuff that I had been going to see in theaters for the past few months. And it'd been a while since uh, we'd seen anything from Alexander Payne. Of course, he's best known for movies like Election, Sideways, Mm -hmm. Nebraska, The Descendants, not all in chronological order. Those are just how they're popping into my head. But anyway, um, very, very much uh, beloved in the indie film world, uh, known for comedy and uh, wry observations about humanity and that kind of stuff. And um, so this is a film set in 1970 in a uh, upscale prep school 
around Christmas time. And Paul Giamatti, who was uh, Alexander Payne's leading man for Sideways in 2004, reteams with him again for the first time in like 19 years and Mm -hmm. uh, plays a classics professor at this prep school uh, who has been living and working at the campus for his entire career. And he's just part of the furniture. He's this crusty old guy who teaches ancient civilizations to these, uh, you know, boys of different ages. And none of the students like him, none of the faculty like him. Sounds like a Paul Giamatti movie. (laughs) He's really good at playing Um, unlikable or disliked characters. Exactly. And uh, when we meet the character, we don't immediately know, of course, why no one likes him or why he's so abrasive to everyone around him. But that's sort of the point of the movie is kind of peeling back the layers of the onion, kind of revealing how this guy got to be who he is. Um, And the the action of the movie kicks off when uh, the Christmas holidays are coming up and almost everyone in the school, teachers and students alike, are all going back to their families to spend the holidays together. But there is a small group of boys uh, who have been left to stay there over the holidays because their families have gone off on trips or otherwise can't reunite with them. And it falls to Paul Giamatti's character to be the one teacher who stays behind to look after these boys. And they are the holdovers of the title. At first, there's a a group of uh, four or five boys, but then there's a bit of a deus ex machina moment and majority of the boys get spirited away. And so it's just down to Paul Giamatti um, and then this one uh, teenager uh, played by a, a... uh, a new actor who I hadn't seen in anything before. I think it might even be his first role, uh, Dominic Sessa. And the two of them are stuck in the infirmary of the school because the rest of the, the school has been, uh, you know, all the heating's been shut down to save money. So they have to stay in the infirmary and they, they're having their meals made for them by this black woman whose young son had just been uh, killed in Vietnam. So she comes into the story, you know, in a more of a service role, but she's got her own backstory and her own reasons for being um, feeling isolated over Christmas. And so the three of them, you know, over the course of the movie, they end up getting uh, closer. They end up understanding each other to an extent. Uh, They get into some misadventures and by the end of it, it just ends up being this, this rather heartwarming kind of tale that, um, you know, with some really solid performances and, it doesn't have any big ambitions or anything like that, but it's a it's a sort of movie that we don't see all that often anymore. You know, with the these sorts of actors telling this kind of story, and uh, I had a really great time. I thought it was it was very nicely put together, and uh, um, I've been recommending it to a lot of people because it's uh, you know it's it doesn't fit into a particular genre or anything, but uh, yeah, really solidly done. A little return to form for Alexander Payne. He'd been quiet for a while. Okay, so so the thing with Alexander Payne's movie is that his characters, all of them go through some, like, deep, deep, deep trauma. (laughs) Is it the same here, where, like, Giamatti and the the student bond together because they've somehow went through the similar type of drama unbeknownst to each other until that one moment where they pour their hearts out? Yeah, so the the movie is constructed in such a way that you get glimpses into that trauma as uh, different events happen because the characters aren't, you know, no no person is going to just sit right down and tell you everything that went wrong in their life all in one, one go. So it's spaced out a little bit and that's good because, you know, it, you um, you get moments of levity that kind of like balance out some of the... Um, uh, the, the more depressing moments from these guys' lives. Paul Giamatti's character is like a uh, a failed academic, essentially. Like he, <laughs> he always plays these characters. Yeah, like he he had been a, a student at Yale or Harvard or or something like that, uh, who had been you know on a track to um, to achieve a whole lot as a uh, uh, you know a classics guy, but then he gets into a run in to do with plagiarism with a fellow student and he gets blamed for for something he didn't do and that ruins his academic career. So the only thing that he can think to do is to go back to the prep school that he had finished high school at and become a teacher there. And he be- therefore becomes part of the furniture. And, um, you know, he has all of unfortunately, he has a few medical conditions that cause him to be even more um uh, loathsome so he has like a a thing that it causes him to smell like fish over the course of the day um some like his body doesn't break 
That's such an Alexander Payne thing. Yeah, so his body doesn't... It's like really obscure. Yeah, exactly. Um, he, ha- he has a uh, lazy eye that kind of drifts off to one side, so all of the... I have that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so but that combined with the smell of fish means that all of the students call him walleye. Um, so... Things like that. Um, meanwhile, the uh, the teenager played by Dominic Sessa is, um, you know, his his parents are obviously very wealthy, but very, uh, you know, out to lunch. They don't really care about him all that much. They're more interested in going off on a honeymoon together than um, uh, than in having him over for Christmas. And so that drives his sense of abandonment. And he's already been kicked out of three schools. He's a danger of getting kicked out of this one. So it falls to Paul Giamatti's character to try to encourage him to. Uh, clean up his act a little bit and um, take things seriously and not uh, not just assume that he's trash so classic Paul Giamatti character where you think he's a dick but he's really not yeah yeah the the, the kind of peel, like I said peeling back the layers kind of finding the the warm heart in the middle of it um, so yeah and the fact that it's set around Christmas obviously and it's coming out around Christmas um, definitely adds to the the sense of like oh okay this is like a more more of a holiday movie but it's got a bit of a bitter taste to it um which makes it so that it doesn't feel too uh too saccharine so oh okay so it doesn't have a happy ending it usually it does okay it does, yeah because usually like, films have an ending where like it works out for everyone somehow or like people come to terms with what they are and what happened I would say it's the latter. So it's not, um, you know, it's not a bad, it's not a sad ending, but it's also not overwhelmingly happy. There's, there are consequences for certain things and, um, you know, sacrifices are made, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Okay. So fairly typical Alexander Payne movie, but he's, he executes it well. Exactly. If you like Alexander Payne's movies, you'll, you'll definitely be at home with the holdovers. The holdovers feels like a movie that was straight from like a, a really good nineties cable TV movie. Does that, Jive? I guess so, yeah. I mean, in the sense that it's a, you know, it's a small scale drama made for adults kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah, I, this is the type of movie that I feel like doesn't do well in theaters, like financially, uh, but no, but really great on like a streaming service as a straight to TV kind of movie. Yeah. So, I mean, I hope uh, somebody picks it up uh, and uh, gives it a home for that reason. Yeah, I'm sure someone will. Um, but we ask, we also have this sense that straight to TV movies are bad, but that's not the case, right? That's not the case anymore. No, I mean, as long as everyone gets paid, then, uh, well, sure. as long as it's well done. Right. So, so that, that does it for like more history related stuff, uh, on this episode, but now we're going to move into more genre type fair, uh, <laughs> So I was talking to somebody last night who described the Marvels as the worst movie he'd ever seen. <laughs> and I mean, I didn't want I didn't want to get into a whole debate because I uh, uh, it's just hyperbole. There's loads of movies out there that are the worst ever made, like, you know, the likes of Tommy Wiseau and Neil Breen, et cetera, et cetera. But um, but the Marvels is probably the worst Marvel movie of all time. Uh, if you believe the headlines right now, are you in that camp or are you a little bit more forgiving of it? It is definitely not the worst movie I've ever seen. Um, I think that's hyperbole. It is also just not very good. <laughs> Actually, no, it's just not not very good. It's not good. What are you prepared to do? I'm invincible. Your powers only make me stronger. So you can't be matched. Can't be controlled. I walked in this movie because it's less than two hours of runtime. And I figured, finally... Like a short, to the point superhero movie mm. where, you know, I don't have to spend a lot of time thinking. Yeah. Unlike, you know, Napoleon, I walked out of the Marvels wishing it was longer. Mm. I understand why Marvel needs to have two and a half hour runtimes because there's a lot of backstory. And I have to say for half the movie, I had no idea what was going on because I didn't necessarily finish the TV shows Mm -hmm. or like follow all like the extracurricular stuff that they had going on. Right. I think tonally it's a mess. I think the characters are very uninteresting unless they're together. The script is just isn't very good. And (laughs) the conflict isn't interesting. Um what what the characters need to do to accomplish their goal wasn't always very clear to start with. And then it's, it's too bad because I do think the casting is, is good. So like between the three leads, Taewona Paris, Brie Larson, mm-hmm. Iman Vellani, I think they're all good. And I think the chemistry is there. A little too much visual effects for my liking. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, things move too much. It doesn't breed. Like at, from some point, there's at one point they're stuck in space, and then they they at another point they're trying to evacuate a whole planet, and then at another point they're at a planet where the only way to communicate is through song and dance, which is what you see in the trailers. I heard about that. Um, yeah, there's some sort of inside joke about Captain Marvel being married, which I thought was really dumb and stupid. Oh, okay. Uh, they explain. They try to explain a lot of things that went on during the blip, like why wasn't Captain Marvel and this and that, and what happened to this character. And, and right. Uh, I mean, unless you watch Captain Marvel and Miss Marvel, the shows right before, I find it really hard to follow. There's supposed to be a big emotional reunion between Taylor Paris's character and Brie Larson. It doesn't hit the right notes. Um, there's a lack of weight in that scene and in that buildup. And I think it's really unfortunate because I know Brie Larson gets a lot of internet hate Mm -hmm. and I don't think it's her fault at all. No. And I, I don't believe that Bob Iger, uh, that COVID was a reason that this was a failure because there was no one to supervise the movie. I, I, is that what he said? I I believe so. Yeah. He said (laughs) the failures of this movie was because there was filmed during COVID and we were basically short on everything and we didn't have anyone to oversee the entire project on set. And I feel like, you know what, that's actually a good thing you didn't have anyone on set to supervise the whole thing. Yeah, because I, well, I don't believe that for a second because, I mean, that's the job of the director. So if... Um, yeah, and and there was some, some, like, some controversy about how this director had like signed on and started doing another project while this movie was being finished. Yes, I heard but about I, that. I, I, I don't think that's a big deal. I think like once you're done filming sure move on like yeah i don't think that means you're not invested or you don't like the project that you just finished yeah yeah Uh, i definitely don't think the start the problems start with the director well no as you said it's like the the script and the the assumption that the film seems to have that uh you are 100 percent caught up on all of the goings on of these characters and other things and you know i think audiences are relatively forgiving of that for the most part for these sorts of big franchise things, because God knows, you know, there was enough people that turned out to see Endgame who could follow everything that had come out, come before that. But, um, and I, I, I think I did want this movie. To I, I think people have, um, they have a certain amount of patience for that, but maybe it sounds like to me, the flaw comes with density. So, you know, if you can, you can have one or two movies coming out per year if you're a big enough fan of Marvel, you can watch each one of those without too much trouble and stay on top of the story. And then, but if you're being expected to watch 20 hours of TV on top of that, it starts to get a little tricky and not everyone can keep up. And then you find yourself in this situation. Yeah. And not everything's interesting. I walked in thinking this will be a quick two under two hour, you know, fun adventure. No, I wanted more. Um, in terms of backstory, Marvel's got a big problem right now because none of the stuff they do is as interesting uh, anymore. Uh, part of it's saturation. Part of it's lack of quality. Part of it is definitely not lack of effort, but definitely I feel like they're emphasizing the wrong things. I, I think they've really become cookie cutter money printing machines. And I don't believe somewhere along the line they mm. got lost. And like if it's um, there's been lots of articles written about this, you know, whether blaming the TV shows or blaming Kevin Feige for being spread too thin. <laughs> well, Jonathan Majors is a big problem, too. The the fact that they had to set up a villain and have and it's been such a rocky road so far. And I think, you know, uh, uh, any audience, it doesn't matter if you're dealing with superheroes or Westerns or, or whatever the genre is like, you're going to have le- you're going to have like diminishing returns in terms of like connecting to the audience over time because everyone will have a different every individual audience member will have a different point where they're like you know what i've seen enough of these now it doesn't hold my interest how interesting is iron man captain america black panther all these people compared to like the Haley steinfeld hawkeye to miss marvel to the young avengers which whatever team that might be you know it, it, they're not very compelling and they're not very interesting. Yeah. Are they, is there a sense that like, you know, with, with Tony Stark, for example, you know, he is the, the billionaire philanthropist playboy. He has an edge to him. You know, Steve Rogers is the perfect counterpoint to him because he is raw, raw pro America doing the right thing, no matter what. 
Um, you've got Bruce Banner as, uh, you know, the scientist with his dark side, Jekyll and Hyde situation. Um, T'Challa, who has uh, the weight of this whole kingdom riding upon him while also being a superhero that saves the world. You, there's there's some, you know, tension in all of these characters. And I wonder if maybe they haven't found the tension or the the opposing force with the three leads in this movie. You know, with Brie Larson's character, she is uh, presented as being fantastically powerful. She can punch through an entire spaceship and be completely fine. Um, and, you know, what is the what is the tension left there? Just does the movie get into that? Like, is there anything she's um, going up against? The growth of each superhero is not necessarily made clear. And what drives them is not necessarily made clear. Uh, that's why season two Loki is quite good because it really completes Loki's arc. And I, I do encourage people to watch hmm. that. Okay. Even though it's a little uneven at times, um, I think it's very well done. Even if the Marvels came out on streaming, I just skip it. Like this might sound harsh, but I don't find many redeeming qualities about it. So then in your opinion, what should Marvel do next? Not bring back Iron Man and Captain America. Like they said <laughs> it would like, that's just a desperate move. That that would make me even more tired of the Marvel franchise. Yeah, because if there's one thing that people are very sensitive to, it's when the stakes are lowered on something. And we, we you know, we are told when Chris Evans retired from this franchise that he was done and he keeps getting asked about it and he keeps saying, no, I'm done. And Robert Downey Jr. has said, I'm done, and but maybe he might return, or I don't well, know. Well, maybe for and the then, money. Then, <laughs> for the money, you know, he's, you know, he's a little bit, uh, just like the character he plays in the movie, you know, there's a sense of like, you know, the wheels can be greased a little bit with enough uh, enough motivation, but... <laughs> so he can make Dr. Doolittle too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but the the the, I think people would be, not everyone, obviously, because there's some there's plenty of people who go to see these movies who don't think in those terms about, you know, being cheated out of a, a significant death or whatever. You know, they don't engage with the movie on that front. But there the some of the fans will be very insulted that, you know, they they were encouraged to care about a particular character dying only to have the death reversed for the sake of more movies. And yeah, I mean, that's a very comic book thing, but I don't think you can do that in movies like move on. Go, go move on to something else. I do think they need to rethink the Kang storyline. I think their next chance at redemption is the Fantastic Four and X-Men series. Yeah, so I know that... Because um, those are like well-known properties and, and they need to do well with those. Yeah, and I know that they have, they have Deadpool 3 in production right now. Um, maybe Hugh... I, I count that as like... I know that's part of NCU, but I feel like that's also just separate because it's so different from the rest. Yes. And um, and and we need to stop all this multiverse stuff. Like it's it's getting a bit much. And I know they're kind of at the point of no return, but I'm just not looking forward to versions of all these characters being meld into one. Like, why does everything need to be part of the same universe? Anyway? Yeah. And I know that they brought in uh, Kelsey Grammer uh, as the Brian Singer Beast. Um, oh, I they, completely forgot about as that. a okay. cameo. So, like, you know, they're obviously they're making a gesture towards, you know, incorporating that era of the X Men into this continuity. Obviously, it's like a different dimension or whatever. But um, so they're, you know, they're obviously saying like Fantastic Four is we're working on that. We're trying to come up with the right way of doing it. But the question is. Do, do those characters cross over with the Marvel characters that we know, or is it an entirely different, as you say, fraction of the uh, the multiverse? So Kelsey Grammer's makeup in X-Men 3 when he was playing the Beast, really good. I thought it was really well done. I thought that was a really good casting. He looks computer generated in this cameo. <laughs> okay. And, but I do think it's one of the better end credit scenes. We, oh. Like as a tease, I think it's way better than whatever we've had before because it confirms that the X-Men are coming back and um, I just wonder where they go with it because I, I I mean, on a personal level, I really love the X-Men, so. Right, yeah, and the, you know, obviously they had Patrick Stewart return in a different dimension. Um, only in, to kill him off, which is hilarious. Only to kill him off, you know, it's just, um, 
but and they had John Krasinski playing uh, Mr. Fantastic in the, that same scene. So, you know, they're, they they keep teasing people with it. They keep saying like, look, hey, you know, this is why we bought 20th Century Fox so that we could put these characters you love into this universe. Yeah. And they did cast Fantastic Four already. So, oh, uh, did they? Who did they get for the the main the main character? Apparently, it's Pedro Pascal, is Mister Fantastic. Oh, okay. Hmm. I I don't remember off the top of my head the cast, but I do know that it's I think pretty much cast. I know Vanessa Kirby might be Sue Storm. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, that makes sense. So I mean, they still have a ton of pull in terms of like getting you know top notch actors and right people for the job is just the overarching sort of overseer and overarching um journey that these two heroes go on to and then like the big baddie at the end they need to figure that out well we will see but uh so for the final uh topic of, of this episode um i'm going to talk about david fincher and the killer this is what it takes My process is purely logistical. If I'm effective, it's because of one simple fact. I don't give a f- um, David Fincher is teaming up with Netflix again, uh, as he did with Mank, his last film. And, you know, David Fincher... Actually, David Fincher's relationship with Netflix precedes even that, because he was the one who brought... House of Cards to Netflix and kind of uh, kickstarted Netflix into the company that it is today. So um, yeah, the, the long relationship there. But The Killer is an interesting movie because it feels, compared to Mank, it feels a little bit scaled down, a little bit um, not inconsequential, but like it it feels like the kind of movie that they that if it were not made by David Fincher, it could easily be made by any other director. Um, oh really eh? that's interesting it has his attention to detail but the the scope of it and the premise are not tremendously um expansive or um significant i guess you could say i really liked it i thought it was incredibly well done well executed michael fassbender is very good in it but um it doesn't have the kind of like set pieces or um really memorable moments that will stick with you a long time after you watch it. Not like, not like some of other, some of Fincher's other movies. And I mean, I'd have to watch it a second time to know for sure, but um, it doesn't, it doesn't rank super high up there on my favorites by him. Um, But like I said, still very well executed. Pardon the pun. (laughs) Um, Tonally, you like what, is it like tonally it is it's got more comedy in it than you'd expect from something about a international hitman okay um because michael fassbender plays a guy who when we're introduced to him you know he's talking a lot in voiceover um using a lot of cliches in his dialogue to describe his process and how uh efficient he is how excellent he is at his job how expensive his rates are all of these things and how he keeps his heart rate down below 60 beats per minute so that he can pull off the perfect uh sniper shot and all of these things um so they you know they spend all of this time convincing you that he is the top of his field but then he goes to take a shot against a target through a window in a, a paris apartment and he misses and he reacts to this by saying fuck and then he runs down to his um scooter zips away into the night covering his tracks but throughout the rest of the film you keep seeing evidence of how skilled he was up until this the point of this big mistake but how often all of his coaching that he does on voiceover all of the talk about his process He's not really following. <laughs> it's just empty words. Okay, he's bad at his job. Yeah. And you're wondering like, oh, OK, so there's there's an aspect of black comedy to this where like, you know, he says things like don't improvise, 
plan everything carefully, but then you'll see him improvising because things won't go his way in a particular moment and he'll have to do something kind of uh, reckless to get out of a situation. You're like, oh, okay. So whatever you were saying in voiceover a second ago, you're not really listening to. So can we, it's a bit of an unreliable narrator situation. Um, and yeah, there's no, no real growth in his character. Uh, we've been talking about, you know, characters growth a lot in this episode. There's no real growth. His his main motivation is just to stay alive and to get revenge for a, an assault that's per, uh, perpetrated against uh, his girlfriend. Um, as uh, she she's assaulted because um, uh, the people that he worked for are trying to punish him for messing up this Paris uh, hit, and he just crisscrosses the globe looking for the perpetrators and you know very. Uh, trying to eliminate them one by one. And you learn shockingly little about him uh, as time goes by, other than the fact that he's a, kind of a hypocrite. Really doesn't sound like a David Fincher film. Yeah, so it's it's for that reason that, that it feels less like something he would make and something and more like something... I'm trying to think of like another director who would make this, like maybe, maybe Doug Liman. It could be like a Doug Liman film or something. But. Well, Doug Liman, I feel like, has no humor. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, but it, it strikes me as something like um, Guy Ritchie. A little bit, but like that almost that would be too comedic, I think, by, by comparison. Like this is this is not funny enough to be a, a true Guy Ritchie film. But you're right. Like the, the there's a Guy Ritchie does a blend of comedy and action in a lot of his things. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a bit of an odd one from David Fincher and um, uh, Michael Fassbender. You know, it, it, he hasn't been seen in a while because he's a professional race car driver when he's. Uh, he's not uh, being an A-list actor, so that's um, whatever. You know, the guys can have hobbies, but uh, what a great hobby, though. Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely something that matches with the intensity of the people he often plays. So he saw an opportunity to come back and team with David Fincher, and who wouldn't want to work with David Fincher if you've got a uh, the the taste for doing hundred takes of every shot? But um, it works for some people, but not for all for all actors. That's for sure. I would still recommend the killer to a lot of people. Like it's um, if you enjoy espionage or, or uh, revenge films at all. Like the, there's definitely something to like here. Uh, all very exquisitely done. The cinematography, the uh, the blocking is all very carefully considered. Um, but just don't go in expecting something on the tier of like Social Network or uh, The Game or uh, anything like that because it's um, uh, it just doesn't have that level of like stick in your mind kind of quality where you're going to be uh, referencing it for, you know, years to come or anything. It's uh, maybe something that like he felt like he could just sort of fit in as before doing some larger project. It is a bit of a departure and I'm a little surprised to hear he's doing a film like this. But I mean, you can't always expect the same thing from directors, right? Final scores for the five films we talked about. Uh, final score for Killers of the Flower Moon for me was a four and a half out of five. Why'd you take the half off? I guess it was just the kind of film that like I can't see myself rewatching super frequently. You know, like something. Well, yeah, it's three hours. It's like the Irishman. I I, I haven't rewatched it since. Yeah, like you know something like Oppenheimer. Like we were saying, like Oppenheimer is something where the uh, the subject matter is uh, super. Um, interesting to me personally. So I've already seen the Oppenheimer twice, but I've only seen Killers of the Flower Moon once. So for that reason, I can't I can't go like, you know, it's an all timer for me, like full five out of five, but very, very good. You know, like we said, one of the best of the year. Um, are you uh, four out of five as well on that one? I vacillated between four and four and a half, but I ended up on four. Uh, then for Napoleon, for you. I gave it three and a half, but I'm almost more leaning towards a three. But the production value is really great. So this is one of those things where the story and the characters really aren't well written, but everything else is quite good. So I ended up at three and a half. I do think Killers from Flower Moon is substantially better than Napoleon, even though there's a half star difference there, though. And then for the holdovers, for me, I gave that four and a half uh, as well. Uh, I liked it a lot. Um, it's I can't think of anything it does wrong necessarily. Uh, just. Uh, that it just instinctively it felt like a four and a half out of five <laughs> okay, okay no that's as good a reason as any in my opinion sometimes you know you, you shouldn't really put too much thought into it yeah um the marvels uh two out of five that's a solid two 
I can't get any higher. <laughs> I thought about it, can do it, but probably not lower than that because I appreciate the effort people put in to it. But it's just too many bizarre things happen in that movie that don't make any sense to me. Right. And then the killer for me, um, four out of five. So, oh, that's still pretty good. Still pretty good. Like I said, it, uh, very well executed. You know, is definitely a a worthwhile use of your time. It just won't be something that will really stick with you. Mm-hmm. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, so for the next episode, uh, we will be, I guess, wrapping up our um, favorites of the year. Yeah, it'd be end of the year. Yeah. So Probably. we'll have we'll have watched more of December's releases. I'm I'm looking forward to uh, certainly uh, poor things, uh, a few others that are coming out this month. Um, so hoping to talk a little bit about that in that episode, because um, you know Christmas always brings uh, the the final blast of uh, Oscar contenders. Uh, so right, yeah, we'll be talking a little bit about that, and then. Um, the uh, January will bring like our uh, our final rankings, I guess, or Oscar preview. Yeah, one of those two. Yeah, <laughs> or both. Or both. Yeah, whatever. Whatever we feel like doing, you know. Of course, this is it's our podcast. This... Um, but until then, my name is Robert Snow in Toronto. My name is Jason Chen in Vancouver. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. The Extra Buttery Podcast is written, recorded, and produced by Jason Chan and Robert Snow. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to rate and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. And remember, popcorn is always better with extra butter. Extra Buttery.